Chapter 12 The dog and the baby drake stayed in the dark, damp cave until morning, saying nothing to each other. The dragon preferred to do his flying during the day, when the most people would see him soaring over their heads and scream in terror. He waited until the clouds were no longer pink and orange, wishing for white clouds that would not distract from the grandeur of his passage. Come, Jordy, the dragon said, and wrapped his claws around the mutt. The time to kill you has not yet arrived, so I shall do my best not to crush you for fear of ruining your flavor. You had best aid me in my quest to outsmart the stars, or you will find yourself in my belly far sooner. He grasped Tanith in his other paw, and they were off. Pangborn flapped his wings until the outermost pinions swept against the sides of the hole they ascended through. They shot straight up into the sky and looked down to see the entire labyrinth below. Then, following Geordi's directions, they momentarily spotted the beach before Pangborn dived into the perpetual fog hanging over the hazy sea ripping them out of the summer country that was his home territory and throwing them into the shining terrain of the spring lakes. The speed of their travel was both marvelous and disheartening. Tanith could not stop herself from looking over at Geordi in the hope of seeing something in his face that would explain what his plan was. Did he really want to trade his beloved master for the betterment of all? Somehow the trade-off seemed incomplete and unsatisfying though she could not find the words to explain why. She could understand his decision not to reveal his true name, but any further betrayal was too much to accept. Spring fell backwards into the previous season. Soggy trees lost their leaves, only to be replaced by evergreens against a backdrop of mountains covered in pure white snow. Hannah drank in the sight of the winter alps, and shortly after, the trees shifted again from lush needles to foliage, this time in a myriad of warm colors that signified their arrival in the autumn forest. All the while, Jordi the dog was completely expressionless, offering only cheerful directions to their winged transporter. Tanith looked down at herself and realized that without setting foot in any of the other countries, she did not change color. She was still redder than Pangborn. Just as they were about to cross the border into the summer lands, Geordi woofed and Pangborn dropped out of the sky into a wide forest clearing. His feet hit the grass with a thud that shook all the neighboring trees, startling deer, rabbits, and blue jays in the process. Pangborn folded his wings away and opened his claws to reveal the two small creatures he carried. The dog and the drake jumped down into a pool of cottonwood fluff that made them sneeze. Now tell me, Geordi, the dragon demanded. Where is he? Truth be told, the dog said, the last George is my master. He is quite a foolish man, and just before I set off to find you, he stepped into a fairy ring and disappeared. We will have to go deeper into the woods to retrieve my master before you can eat him. Very well, the dragon said, and his enormous size shrank by halves until he was only as big as an elephant. Take me to the fairy ring. Geordi led him down the cobblestone road that both he and the baby drake remembered well, having both come this way on their journeys that brought them together. This time, Tanith felt much less self-conscious personally, having met many good people who did not expect bad things from her just because she was a dragon, while also feeling embarrassed of the lumbering red giant she was traveling with. He was not the remarkable teacher and lord of his domain that she had longed to emulate. Instead, Pangborn was an old, imposing bully. The forest thickened until the trio walked in the shade of a close-knit canopy. Then Geordi showed them where to leave the road behind. It was obvious that Pangborn was still too large to fit between trees without ripping them out of the ground, so he shrank down to the size of a cow. He was just small enough to squeeze into the clearing with the circle of toadstools. Here it is, Geordi said. My master set foot in the ring, and the fairies took him away. We must convince them to release the man named George. Then you can eat him. Unlike humans, creatures like dogs and dragons can see fairies without much trouble. The three of them looked up to see the tiny beings watching them from behind leaves and twigs, or bouncing on the air around the toadstools. Grins played across their sharp little faces. 
A particularly bold one flitted over and alighted on Geordi's back to have a look at Pangborn the Red. Give me the man named George, demanded the dragon. The fairy tipped its head to one side, staring at him with its curious smile. You must give us something in return, it whispered in a voice that crawled across the traveler's skin. The trade must be fair. Pangborn snorted. I am very rich and powerful, he said dismissively. I can procure whatever it is you want in exchange for George. Again, that unsettling smile. Then you will not mind sharing half your pretty hoard with us? The suggestion was so offensive to the dragon that he reared up on his back feet and spouted fire. Branches were singed, and fairies fluttered away, giggling. <laughs> you bugs have plenty of playthings, Pangborn snarled. One is not worth my own weight in gold. You do not have to agree, the fairy said with a shrug. And we do not have to give up our toy. Pangborn angrily watched the fairy fly off to rejoin its kin. While Tanith stood by anxiously flexing her claws, Geordi went over to the cow-sized dragon to discuss what they should do. He took a seat in the grass. I had forgotten how greedy the fairies can be, Geordi said sympathetically. Half your fortune! That is a terrible loss. Very selfish of them. Indeed, Pangborn agreed. I need the man in order to protect myself from harm. I have outsmarted the stars themselves. The fairies do not really need him. They shall be punished for laughing at me. We must try something different, the dog said. If they will not give you my master, then I propose you take the man from them. The dragon huffed smoke, filled with new determination. You are right, Jordy, he said. You are very clever for a snack, but how shall I do it? Try to frighten them, was the response. At Geordi's urging, the dragon transformed himself into a massive lion. He roared at the fairies till branches quaked and lost leaves. He smashed toadstools as he jumped and swiped at the beings with his claws. Again and again, they just tittered and leapt away. The dog then suggested something meaner, and Pangborn turned into a heavy-footed ogre. He shook the tree trunks with terrifying force. When that did not work, the dog barked a new idea, and the ogre became a wolf. But even the greatest beast of the forest did nothing to thwart the fairy's glee. <laughs> we must try something different, Geordi said. Come, let us try to reach the fairy realm on our own. The dog fell to digging furiously inside the ring of toadstools, and Pangborn was quick to transform himself into a hound. Together they pawed at the ground. They dug and dug while Tanith and the fairies watched until they could go no deeper. Under many layers of soil, they found a solid floor of pure crystal. We must try something different, Geordi said. You must try to sneak inside the fairy realm. Look around and see if there is a hole somewhere that will let you inside. Again, listening to what the dog suggested, Pangborn turned himself into a cat to have a look around. He found many animal dens belonging to snakes and groundhogs, but nothing that would get him into the crystal catacombs. Geordi said something smaller might work, so the dragon became a squirrel, the treasure hunter of the animal kingdom. He dug and sniffed and searched to no avail. Finally, they thought he should try something even smaller, and Pangborn became a mouse. Yet still, there was no way into the fairy realm. Dragon and dog sat down to rest and discuss whether a beetle would be more effective. Tanith sat by and observed all this, becoming more and more perturbed until at last she got up to join the endeavor. There is no way to enter if they do not want you to, she said sternly. Lord Pangborn, you must either convince them to bring out the man named George or convince them to take you down to him. How would I do that? Pangborn asked, exhausted and angry. They are stubborn, infuriating bugs. They would never let me inside. I believe only humans are taken to the fairy realm, the baby drake said. So, you must become a human so they will take you directly to George. Once you are there, my lord, surely the crystal catacombs will shatter when you return to your proper form. The reinvigorated dragon took a breath and shapeshifted once more. Now an old man stood in the clearing, full of confidence, 
he took his first steps on two wobbly legs, smashing the last of the toadstools. He walked directly into the fairy ring and promptly vanished. 